Mike McKenzie. Hi. Hi, Michael. There's some background noise, but I can hear you. Good afternoon. Afternoon. How are you? Thanks. I dropped something that's with something bounced off the table. Great. All right. I'll be back one second. I'm just going to grab a glass of water and uh, yeah, we'll get going in a few minutes. Hi everyone, just one minute. We're gonna get started shortly.
Okay. I think we will get rolling. Gaveling this meeting of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee to order. Um, for the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of the Committee. Um, this working session is being recorded and live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv. It will be rebroadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Verizon Channel 1964. Um, and this the budget review process uh, this year consists of both hearings and working sessions. So the working sessions are counselor only um, and they're designed for generating questions um, to send over to the administration in advance of our future hearings. Um, so as such, we don't take public testimony at the working sessions, uh, but we do take public testimony a number of other ways. So you can go to um, boston.gov slash council dash FY21 budget to see how to submit video or written testimony through the website. You can also email written testimony to ccc.wm at boston.gov. You can send um, or deliver your testimony in any language. We'll make sure it gets translated for the council. Um, you can also come and testify in person or uh, in person on Zoom. Um, so you can come to any of our hearings and there's a Zoom link um, which will be provided and then you can uh, wait in the waiting room and watch on a live stream and give testimony at the end of the hearing. We'll also have two dedicated public testimony hearings, one on May 26th, which is a Tuesday at 6 p.m. focused on BPS, and one on May 28th at 6 p.m. Um, Thursday focused on the rest of the city departments. So we do hope you'll join in in that way. Um, and if you submit a video of testimony related to an upcoming hearing, we will append it to the end of the hearing um, so that it plays as part of that video. Um, and you can informally tweet us your questions as well using the hashtag boss budget, BOS budget. So today's working session is on dockets 0588 to 0590, orders for the FY21 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Dockets 0591 to 0592, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations and 0593 to 0596, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Between them, those are the set of dockets that make up the FY21 proposed budget from the mayor. Um, we'll also be considering today docket 0609 to 0611, orders to authorize the limits for BPD revolving funds. Um, and our focus areas today in this working session will be generating questions for the Boston Police Department, the Boston Fire Department, and Boston EMS, who will all be coming before us for a joint hearing on public safety. Um, and then also the Boston Public Health Commission, um, which will be coming in for its own hearing, including the Office of Recovery Services. Um, and, uh, and then um, also as part of the public safety one, as I said, we'll be considering those Boston Police Department revolving funds. Um, so the Academy of Canine and Fitness um, revolving funds. So that's the topics of today's working session. Um, what we're gonna do, and I, what we're gonna do is do two rounds of questions. My colleagues have been joining for many of these. People know how this goes. Um, so we'll start with public safety. So we'll do a round of just questions for the police department, the fire department, EMS about the revolving funds. Um, and then we'll do a second run um, that is the public health commission. Um, and if you, if, you know, if you need to run and you can get all your questions for both into one round, great. But like, but you know, I'm asking folks to break them up just so that we give everybody a turn. Um, so I wanna recognize who is here. I've been joined by Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, um, Councillor Liz Breeden, District 9, Councillor Kim Janey, District 7 and Council President, Councillor Andrea Campbell, District 4, Councillor Anissa Isabi George at large, and Councillor Matt O'Malley um, of District 6. So I'm grateful to all of them for coming. Um, and without further ado, we'll start off. So Councillor Flaherty, you'll have the floor first, followed by Councillor Breeden and then Councillor Janey. Um, and, uh, and again, um, I would love if we could start with questions related to fire police and EMS. Councilor Flaherty. Sure. Good, I'll keep it tight. And they're all kind of relative to one another. Um, one is the attrition rate. Are we keeping up with the attrition rate uh, for police, fire, and EMS? I know that we are, are um, in the middle of uh, obviously the, the pandemic and that's stressing and straining our public safety departments, but um, specifically we've been kind of behind uh, the eight ball a little bit with respect to attrition. And it's my understanding that we have a bunch of uh, next two to three years, we're gonna, we're gonna see some big waves of retirement and just wanna make sure that we're not caught flat footed on that. Um, with respect to uh, police department, if I could just get an answer in terms of, uh, and I bring this up every year, and I think that Lee, there's a huge cost savings 
piece of it, but also from a morale standpoint. We literally, we have lieutenant detectives, uh, captain detectives, lieutenant detectives, and sergeant detectives, all supervising detectives, yet they've never been detectives themselves. And it's, it's, it's an upside down formula uh, that I think needs to be addressed. And um, not only from, from a, just from a, a lead and in, in command standpoint, but from a morale standpoint, you could have someone working as a detective a, a good portion of their career um, and they won't become a sergeant detective yet someone that's never been a detective will become a sergeant detective and uh, a huge cost savings um, if we could uh, righten um, that dysfunction up and uh, not quite sure any system, quite frankly, um, in the public or private sector would allow for such a system and uh, arguably um, others will complain that it's probably driven more by kind of uh, patronage and et cetera. But um, that needs to be addressed at some point. No one's ever given me any real logic as to why a captain detective, a lieutenant detective, and a sergeant detective would ever be supervising detectives when they've never been detectives themselves. Um, I want to shift to the fire department and see if we can get those two chief cars restored. Um, those two chief cars were eliminated, arguably because of political retribution um, about 10 years ago. So we get two areas of our city that are without a chief, and that's uh, your district, uh, Madam Chair, uh, which, as you know, the hospitals um, and, uh, and everything that's going on right now with COVID, and also in, in our colleague, Councilor O'Malley's district with the, uh, the gas pipeline. So strangely, uh, two parts of our city are left without a district chief and, um, and that should be addressed at the very least, make an effort to restore one of, uh, one of the chief departments. And then if we can shift to uh, EMS um, Bragdon Street. I just wanna get an update on the Bragdon Street. Uh, that's sort of our command center. And um, I've offered uh, and suggested years ago that uh, the city of Boston should actually buy uh, the Bragdon Street location and make the all the necessary repairs and, and, and upgrades. Uh, we currently lease it now and not quite sure what year of the lease we're in, but might make some sense um, for the Boston Public Health Commission slash EMS to once and once and for all address that. It's at the epicenter. It's right in the heart of our city and it's the command center uh, for everything police, fire, EMS during a major event. Arguably COVID-19 is a pretty major event. And fortunately for us, it's uh, right near our police headquarters, our fire headquarters, and most, most importantly, our, uh, our Boston Medical Center and uh, Boston uh, and the Public Health Commission. So, and um, I think that's about it. I noticed a little bit of a dip in the police department budget. Um, we've got, um, I think we've got three criminalist positions coming on board. Um, we're adding a 25 member recruit class uh, for 2021. Not quite sure that, again, that's going to keep up with attrition, but that's a good question that needs to be, to be answered. And um, I'd like a status update on the, uh, on the body cameras. Uh, we rolled out, it was a $2.3 million commitment to support uh, the phase in. So I'm looking to get some more details about uh, successes, uh, if any, uh, from the program and or um, whether or not we need to enhance it. We also saw some investments in the crime lab as well as in the new community engagement bureau. So um, it'd be interesting uh, also to, to, to talk about the, um, we made some changes also with respect to reporting in terms of um, how, uh, how they do the, uh, how did they do the, so the, the one ones, um, I think they were gonna try to do them, submit them electronically. So curious to see um, their incident reports, other folks know them as, but they were gonna try a new, New, um, new record management system to enable police officers to submit the electronic incident reports um, so that they can, the turnaround could be quicker. A lot of times, not a, not a lot of folks realize, but when an officer makes an arrest, that officer is basically off the street um, for the transport in the booking process. And it, it could be hours. Um, there's gonna be a better way to do that. And I think that the new record management system was gonna enable the officers to be able to submit the incident reports electronically to kind of free them up to get back out in the streets to do patrol. So uh, I'd be curious to see um, what the BPD, I think the Maria Chivas would probably be the best person to, to, uh, to speak to that. Um, that's it. I think for me uh, in general, that's sort of a uh, sort of a cross section of the police fire and EMS. So appreciate your time, Madam Chair. Perfect. Thank you so much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, next up is Councillor Breeden, then it'll be Councillor Janey and then Councillor Camper. Councillor Breeden. Thank you. Um, um, 
I understand that there was funding allocated for a data analyst to do look at traffic accident patterns. Um, I just wonder if that position had been filled and how, how that was going. Um, also, in relation to the police department, um, I had a question, it's more of a curiosity about if there is a service garage at District 14 um, in Brighton Centre, because there seems to be an, a lot of police vehicles parked in the municipal lot. I know part of the municipal lot is, is allocated for police vehicles, but it just seems, it was a curiosity more about um, how that municipal lot uh, is doubling up as a police parking um, parking um, lot as well. <laughs> um, given the shortage of parking in this in Brighton Centre, I was wondering how that was working out. Um, and then also the growth in the population in in Alston Brighton over the last um, decade. Um, I I was wondering if there's any plans to evaluate the fire department and the emergency EMS, EMS uh, services of, in, in the district, in District 9. Uh, and also, the uh, I'm jumping towards, do you want me to wait on the EMS or do you want me to lump it all in in one? No, go ahead with EMS. We're going to save the Public Health Commission itself for the second round, but okay. EMS is under them, but we're doing all the public safety ones at once now. Um, EMS, um, just, uh, they're looking for a new station for their... Um, for their ambulances and uh, I just wanted to know an update on, on where they are with the new station plan for the AMS uh, in, in Alston Brighton. Um, and that's about it for now. I'm sure I'll think of more. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor Breeden. All right. Council President Janey and then it'll be Councillor Campbell and then Councillor Asabi George. Thank Councilor you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for all three departments, I'm very interested in where we are in terms of diversity numbers and, and a breakdown by gender um, for all three departments. Um, on all three departments, I also would be interested in what um, services uh, or issues are around um, mental health for the police officers, for the EMS workers and for fire because of the high frequency of trauma that they all experience in their work. So definitely interested in that. Um, I'm interested in understanding with the new commissioner for fire, certainly uh, just goals um, for, for that department, um, particularly around changing the culture. So for, for folks who have been on this body for a while, we know we have some issues uh, in the culture with the fire department, particularly regarding women firefighters. So I would be really interested in what investments, uh, where we are in terms of those commitments that had happened prior, the commitments that we had on the books, um, where we are in fulfilling those, and where we are in terms of investing to support uh, the women firefighters and creating a new culture uh, within the fire department. So I would be very interested in that. I understand there's a slight increase in the fire department and would just be interested in, in what that is about, where that's going to, is that just cost of living stuff? Um, also, I think I saw a decrease in police. Yes, and that was after a couple of increases. So I'm wondering what that is about. Um, I'd be interested in any updates around the various initiatives for the cadets, um, just where we are and, and how we move those things forward. Um, let me see here. Yep. Uh, training, so also just how we continue to support, um, again, across all three departments, how we invest in our workforce. Um, so I'd be interested in any um, dollar amounts that are going toward investing in the workforce in terms of training. So pretty uh, large buckets around diversity, um, training, the culture, um, trauma and mental health, um, and specific questions for fire department, just you know, with the new commissioner and trying to overcome some of the challenges that we've had in the past. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Madam President. Um, and, I, and I will note that we were joined a little while ago by both Councillor Flynn from District 2 and Councillor Mejia um, at large. Um, next up is uh, Councillor Andrea Campbell, who is also the Chair of Public Safety. 
Um, and so I'll be recognizing her and then it'll be Councillor Sabi George after. Um, thank you, Councillor Bach. Um, I'll be brief, you know, first of all, I'm very grateful to all of the agencies who are being flexible, obviously, and joining us here given the, what we're dealing with COVID-19. Um, and thank you, Councilor Bach, for bringing everyone together. Um, I too had a question related to the data analysts, uh, which came out of a hearing order we filed and um, the status of that hire with the specifics of the position will entail. Um, I also had questions related to the number of officers. We've been talking for years around uh, the need for more, specifically in certain districts, not only for traffic concerns, but also related to the number of incidents of violence we're seeing in certain districts. So curious as to where we are there. Um, I have a question around the youth fund, youth development fund, where we are with that. Um, what uh, COVID-19 will have, in terms of the impact we'll have on that fund. Um, and of course, that's true for all budgets. Um, questions around the diversity numbers. Again, what's the strategy? You know, we've put out some recommendations and would love to hear more around that, uh, specifically for the fire department, uh, the cadet program that was uh, pushed for, any questions, uh, any status updates on that, which was used as a tool to increase diversity. Um, so anything there would be very helpful. Um, and specifically on um, domestic violence cases, uh, brought that up this morning on a call with the mayor and it continues to be a topic of discussion as we get creative and in, in helping find uh, housing but specifically from BPD's perspective and EMS um, and fire may have something to add um, what they're seeing there, what they're seeing if you're working um, and where they can use some support um, I, I'll leave it there just to be mindful of, uh, of the time and respectful to my colleagues thank you Councilor Bach great thank you so much Councilor Campbell um, now it's uh, Councillor Asabi George, and then it'll be Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Asabi George. Thank you, Madam Chair. I may do two rounds on this just because I do know I've got an extensive list of questions for all three uh, divisions when we think about public safety, uh, police, fire, and EMS. First, when thinking about all three of them, I'm very curious about the work that we're doing around coverage in certain pockets of our city, like the Seaport, Boston, uh, South Boston's waterfront for BPD, BFD, and EMS. There's some conflict around uh, state police coverage. There's also, not right now, because we're not experiencing the same sort of congestion issues, but fire and EMS being able to access, um, access that area. Also, when th thinking about the three divisions, uh, I called for a hearing order, which we're trying to schedule that at this moment, but around uh, wellness for the three first responder agencies, especially as it pertains to access to mental health services and physical health support. Some uh, fire has access to O2X, for example. Can we make sure uh, that either EMS and police have similar access? Uh, that's just one example, but also access to uh, specific mental health uh, services as I think Councillor Janey um, maybe referenced is you know, the impacts of trauma on our first responders. Specific to Boston Police, I have an interest in the work around the crime lab. Again, I've called for a hearing order on at least uh, forming a study and perhaps uh, giving new life to an aged study that happened about the needs of our crime lab, both in um, the staffing capacity, but spacing capacity and the ability to perhaps do more uh, work through their space or certain things that we rely on state uh, lab to do. So I look forward um, to hearing about that. I'm also have advocated for a number of years and have done it to some success and I'm continuing to advocate to increase the number of social workers that work with Boston Police to be the best clinician, uh, best clinician uh, in partnership with Boston Medical Center. Uh, I will echo uh, Councilor Braden and Councilor Campbell's call for that cash analyst position in BPD. Um, also, questions around the Bureau of Community Engagement, that's a newer effort. So, just hopeful that we can uh, continue to build that and have a deeper understanding of the, the works. Uh, the work there. Um, I'll say, um, I guess I'll, I'll do it now. So there is some, there is a fund, uh, an external fund to support efforts of violence against women through this, through a state grant. And it is funding, this external fund is funding a civilian domestic violence advocate who would provide referrals to shelters 
uh, and assistance in obtaining restraining order, planning, service referral, and other things in navigating sort of the process in the criminal justice system, uh, specific to victims of domestic violence, which I know is important to all of us on the council. So just curious about the status of that external fund. Uh, it appears that there is a decrease in that. Uh, so I'm wondering what that means for that advocate position. And then due to the current pandemic, we're experiencing for sure an increase in domestic violence. So I'm just curious about the impacts that has on our, um, on our families and protecting our residents. In uh, regards to Bragdon Street, which Councilor Flaherty brought up, I am, um, I actually feel very different than Councilor Flaherty when it comes to Bragdon Street. I think that we should be looking for a new opportunity, perhaps a facility that the city of Boston owns. Um, that, that space is a tremendous amount of investment and we are spending, I think, upwards of $30,000 a month on a lease um, for that property. So I think that you need to stop looking for a new location. It is not, I don't think it's a place for um, us to operate um, our emergency response out of. And I think that we've got some work work to do there. So I'm just curious about that. Curious about an analysis, whether it's on that property itself, um, but certainly as part of looking at a property that we potentially own in the city of Boston. Um, also around uh, Boston EMS, I had an opportunity a few months ago to ride with Squad 80, which uh, responds to overdose, overdose and recovery uh, services. So I'd like I, I was really impressed with the work of this team. It's a very small team uh, working with a population that is in, in real need of supports, and they work in collaboration with our um, uh, police, police team and their outreach efforts. They work very closely with healthcare for the homeless and our homeless services. They work uh, very closely with the uh, two shelters, the women and Southampton Street for men. So I think that we really could use an additional investment in, in what uh, resources they have and, um, and what they're doing. I think that through that report, though, we should also hear and learn about the uh, number of Narcan or how often we've administered Narcan, what sort of the volume of Narcan, uh, how much we're purchasing of Narcan and what the typical dose of Narcan is to reverse an overdose. And then of course we'll get, I'm sure after the typical presentation, the number of 911 calls, what the volume of particular types of those calls are. Um, and I also think, it, and we've talked about this a, a little bit over the years, but the amount of reimbursement we've been successful through EMS and getting, and I think that's an area that we can run a deficit in and, and we're as a city picking up the rest of that uh, cost. But if we're picking up the cost for reimbursement and we're only being reimbursed in response to a 911 call to bring a patient or a resident to uh, an emergency room, should we then be thinking creatively, especially when thinking about the work around recovery that we do as a city, should we be thinking creatively about bringing uh, residents in need of different services, not necessarily an emergency room visit to another location? A number of us have visited a number of cities, in particular looking at recovery services and the opioid epidemic, opioid epidemic's impact in those cities, and some of uh, EMS services in those cities are taking a person in need directly into a program you know, for services outside of the emergency room. So if, if we're not getting reimbursed at the rate that we should be and that the, we're not being reimbursed at all in many cases, should we be thinking creatively about the way we're spending our city's resources? Uh, also have questions around SHARPs, what's EMS's practice around SHARP removal? And, um, and that also correlates, I think, with Boston Fire, because I think they play a relationship, there's a relationship there with uh, proper shops disposal. Curious within all three branches, BPD, uh, BFD, and EMS, what the volume of shops is that they're collecting. I have a few other questions. I see that my colleagues are in the queue, um, so I will use another round. Thank you, Madam Chair. Perfect. Thank you so much, Councillor Asabi-George, and now Councillor O'Malley, and then it'll be Councillor Flynn. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, a special thank you to Michelle and Cora and everyone on Central Staff, Shane, who's been doing a great job uh, taking down all these questions, of which I have many. So I will uh, try to buzz through them for this round. First, as it relates to the BFP, um, looks like there's about a $4 million increase, which is mostly personnel. Later in the budget book, it talks about $3.9 million salary savings. I celebrate both of those numbers, but want a little more detail on what that means in terms of salary savings. I assume it may have something to do with uh, benefits or insurance. Um, similarly, there's a, there seems to be big equipment lease, um, uh, not losses, but decreases. It's about $1.4 million for Boston Fire. What exactly does that mean? Does this just happen to coincide with the fact that we're on year two of a lease? Um, typically, how many vehicles do we lease uh, and what percentage of those leased vehicles uh, I would assume are not the, the fire trucks themselves, uh, more of the cars uh, are electric uh, or hybrids. Um, similarly, I want, as always, to know about response times as well as different trends we may see. Every couple of years, there are different trends in sort of fire safety. A couple of years ago, we passed uh, an ordinance to mandate sprinkler systems. I want to, we don't, this is, doesn't have to be a question, but just that was a response to a trend that we were seeing in some large scale buildings as well as how construction materials can play a factor as well. Um, secondly, and I'm shocked that my dear colleague and friend from South Boston, Mike Flaherty, didn't talk about the uh, call boxes, these beautiful old call boxes that we see all around Boston that I don't think anyone uses and we pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for uh, upkeep. Uh, I am as much a, a lover of Boston history as you will find, uh, but I do think that there could be an opportunity, I don't know, for something else to be used for these. So I want to talk about the call boxes, how much we're spending, and how many people actually use them. Moving on to the Boston Police Department. We've gone from Boston's brightest to Boston's finest. Um, they're about level funded this year. We have seen a personnel increase of about $2.4 million. Uh, we've seen contracted utility services down by a million dollars. So I want some more detail on that as well as the equipment lease, 1.8 million. Again, wanna know if that's similarly what I assume that we're on the off year of a lease, which is why the number's gone down but um, the number of vehicles that we currently lease that are electric or hybrid. Uh, we've also seen a significant increase in the capital budget, which is great. So I wanna talk a little bit more specificity about that. Um, the bicycle unit, something that I wholeheartedly support, a great way to get our officers into the neighborhoods to well complement our community service cadres, which are second to none as far as I'm concerned. So I wanna talk about increasing and growing the bicycle unit. Uh, Next, Boston EMS. Uh, thank you. I, an earlier speaker, I forget whom, had initially talked about the need for a garage. Uh, this is something I've been working on for many, many years. Nine out of 22 basic life support ambulance units do not have a garage or bay to go to. That's more than one third, nearly a half. Um, that's a staggeringly high number. We have an opportunity in and around Franklin Park, which is the geographic center of the city, to actually build something that can be a real garage, a real bay for the men and women, uh, the paramedics and the EMTs of Boston EMS. And it's something that I will continue to push. So I want to get a status on that. Better garages, better bays, better opportunities for these uh, hardworking men and women. Um, not only is it good for the environment uh, and good for the, uh, the safety of our uh, first responders, but uh, it's the right thing to do and we are long overdue on that. Uh, finally, I want to again talk about what response times are, as well as the percentage of the calls for Boston EMS that are called priority ones. It's usually anywhere from 20 to 25 percent. I'm going to see if that trend continues. And finally, and I think several counselors have brought this up, uh, we've seen the city's population grow by significant numbers. Are we seeing uh, membership and uh, the number of officers, firefighters, and EMTs and paramedics keep, pay, keep pace with that? Uh, so I'd like to see how those numbers have grown in terms of our deployed force uh, and what we need to do to make sure that we have supports uh, both for them, the men and women of our public safety officials, and also the residents of Boston to know that they'll have a um, a, a public safety professional uh, in close proximity at all times. That's all for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley, for all those questions. And um, now it'll be Councillor Flynn and then Councillor Mejia. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Bork. Um, just wanted to focus first on the um, Boston EMS. My number one priority as it relates to um, EMS is continuing to make progress in getting an EMS station presence 
in the South Boston waterfront. It is critical that we have an EMS presence in that neighborhood. It's growing very fast. There's a lot of businesses. There's a large population in the South Boston waterfront, the Fort Point area. And we, need, we desperately need an EMS facility in that neighborhood. Um, continuing with EMS. EMS, Boston Police and Boston Fire. Um, I would like to see a, this might be need to be discussed further, obviously, but I'd like to see a uh, registry of all first responders that were exposed to COVID-19, um, making sure that we study the COVID-19 and the impact it has on our first responders <laughs> tested positive, um, factoring in what this impact has on their uh, medical insurance, what impact this has on time off, what impact this has on, on sick leave, um, possibly retirements. Um, those are critical issues that I know we're going to be dealing with. I served in the Persian Gulf. I'm, I'm a member of a registry called the Gulf War Registry. If you've been exposed to toxins in the air, which I have, um, you're, you're, in, you're, you're entered into a database and um, it's a way to track your health and to know what programs might be available for you. I think it's critical that we do that with our Boston's uh, first responders, making sure we, we especially study COVID-19 and its impact on first responders. This is a long-term process um, and, and we're going to need to stay on top of it. Um, the mental health of EMS, Boston Fire, Boston Police is also critical, making sure that they have the adequate uh, mental health counseling services. Um, going to Boston Police Department and all of them, but it's the, the health and wellness of, of every first responder is, is critical. I think it was Council Flaherty or Council O'Malley, O'Malley mentioned response time for, for all three as well. I also want to look at the retention and retirement of all three. And I'd like to get an update from our commissioners on just estimates on what they see over the next year or next two years in terms of potential retirements and what impact that will have on, on their respective uh, division divisions. Um, I was talking to the police commissioner recently about mental health counseling, again, for the Boston Police Department um, and the, their suicide prevention program. Um, I know Commissioner Gross is doing excellent work on making sure that our police officers receive mental health counseling. Um, nationally, the rate of suicide of, poli of, of police is very high as it is veterans, 24 veterans complete suicide day. I know the numbers are very high also for, for police officers throughout the country. I wanna to continue to work with the police commissioner of the city of Boston on that, on that program. Um, Councilor O'Malley mentioned it, but the, and I think Councilor Osabi George mentioned it as well, but the, the jurisdiction issues still haven't been resolved on the Boston police down at the South Boston waterfront. It is not the fault of the city of Boston or, or the um, police. We just have to continue working closely, hopefully with the, uh, with, with our state, state leaders on that issue and making sure that at least there is joint jurisdiction that Boston police um, are unable to um, share with the state police down at the South Boston waterfront. Uh, Council of Flaherty mentioned the uh, Boston fire, uh, two chiefs that they're shot in, uh, that they're, they're not, they don't have in various locations 
I believe you mentioned West Roxbury might be one of them. Uh, that's something I would, I would also support. The health wellness of the fire department. I'd like to get it. I'd like to see how, uh, how our maintenance division at the Boston Fire Department is doing. Our fire apparatus is doing what condition our fire apparatus is in. Um, and the fire alarm that Councilor O'Malley mentioned, the fire alarm system has a long and proud history in Boston. They do tremendous, outstanding work um, in making sure that our fire alarms, our fire boxes are, are in operation. Um, so I'd just like to highlight the tremendous work they are doing throughout, throughout our city as well. Um, and also, also making sure that our first responders, giving them an opportunity, especially if they're veterans, giving them an opportunity to uh, use a different part of, of sick leave so that they're able to go to their VA medical appointments. They, sh they shouldn't have to take uh, traditional sick leave for a VA appointment. There should be another part of, of time maybe is the right word, another part of time so that if they have a scheduled VA appointment, they could use that without taking a traditional sick day. That's something I've, I've asked, we asked for through, over the last three years, something I'll continue to um, focus on. Um, and I know you have the gavel council box, so I'll hold off and ask my remaining questions on the second part. Thank you, council block. Fantastic, thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. And thank you for all those good questions. Councilor Mejia, you yes. have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Bach. Um, I share a lot of the same sentiments that my colleagues who have already um, asked. I, I echo a lot. I just have very specific things um, that I just want to uplift. Um, one is, uh, this is for um, BPD. Um, in 2019, Boston police uh, worked 9,000 hours of overtime which kind of cost the city over a half a million dollars during the straight pride um, parade. And I'd like more information on the following things. How was the number of police officers needed for this event determined and how, and on the average, how many overtime hours did each officer work? I'm just curious in terms of like how these uh, decisions are being made and what, what we decide to deploy folks to. Um, Regarding cultural competency trainings, um, what were the cultural competency trainings um, were in place for officers working the straight pride parade, if any, um, and what new cultural competency trainings have been put in place since then, um, just in terms of, of dealing with um, folks of diverse background, just curious about that aspect. Um, following up on Councillor Flaherty's question on the body cams, as of 2019, the BPD only requires officers to have their body cams on during regular shifts. What is the reasoning, uh, what's the reason for this requirement? Um, one of the BPD goals is to provide enough PPE for all of their members. Do all of their members currently have PPE? And if so, how long did it take um, to procure enough materials? I'm curious, I'd like, to, I'd like more information on the BPD's um, gang um, database. What information is it collects? Who has access to this information? And how is this information shared with outside BPD, outside of BPD? I also have some particular questions on the point of system for gang affiliation. So I'd like them to come prepared to speak on that. Like, how do we determine who's gang affiliated? Can the BPD provide a breakdown of how many police uh, officers speak languages uh, other than? English and how many, how the BPD goes about staffing those officers in particular neighborhoods. Um, a lot of these questions um, that I am curious about, as well as it relates to um, hiring and retaining, one thing is to bring people in and the other is to um, really provide the type of professional development and the culture within these spaces to keep people wanting to work there. Just curious about what the retention process looks like and um, also curious about the community policing efforts, um, how that's going, um, what role are, are, are 
the community civic association of play, um, schools, just really intrigued by kind of what community policing um, looks like in terms of outreach and uh, whether or not it's in different languages and also targeted by neighborhoods. Um, I don't think that one size fits all. Every, every neighborhood has its unique challenges. And so I'm just curious about how they set something aside to help support those initiatives um, and not in a cookie cutter way. And I know that our DPD um, members are, are hard at work and we really do appreciate um, them and all that they do. And I'm just interested in learning um, what type of resources they need to be better serve our community, especially from a cultural competency standpoint. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, all right, I will do my questions now and then we'll swing back to the top. Um, so I guess one sort of just uh, ways and means question I have is just that the operating budget for each individual department inside of the Boston Police Department budget doesn't really provide us with um, detail on line items. It's sort of all rolled into personnel and non-personnel. Um, so I think, and this is related to something that Councillor O'Malley asked about, but just would love to have a more detailed breakdown to let us examine the budget in more detail. Um, I think, you know, obviously we have a huge portion of the budget that's the school department and we get a more detailed line on that. And the police department's also a pretty large, um, not as big as the school department, but a pretty large portion of our budget. Um, so for, so, and I think also there are a number of questions I have that I would be able to answer if I had a little more detail. So, you know, there was a $4 million increase in funds for the police commissioner's office from last year. Just curious about what's causing that and then um, for BAT operations funding, it looked like in FY20, we went from about $700,000 for personnel and then up to 6.5 million. So just trying to understand what that's being utilized for. Um, someone else has mentioned it, but just would love to understand how COVID is impacting anticipated overtime hours, um, which I know has been a long-term um, challenge and a challenge for the council to sort of understand the budgetary impact of year on year. Um, the Bureau of uh, Field Services is showing a $12 million increase in funding. So I'd love to understand that. And then you've got a large decrease, about eight and a half million for the Bureau of Professional Development, um, which I was curious about, especially as we're looking to increase the number in our academy classes. Um, I think the funding for the Bureau of Professional Standards has dropped quite a bit in the last few years, as has the Bureau of Investigative Services. Um, I think by more than 10 million since last year and almost 20 million going back to 2019. So just would really like to understand what's going on with that sharp decrease, um, especially since you know it's important for us to have that accountability inside of our police office. Um, again, would echo folks just wanting to understand how the body worn camera program is running. Um, and I know there's a vendor contract through FY21, but sort of have we thought about extending that or doing a new RFP and what have we learned? And to the point, I would definitely echo Councillor Mejia's question about um, the sort of logic of not having the cameras on during overtime. It strikes me that to the, I, I mean, I imagine that that's a collective bargaining question, um, but uh, to the extent that it makes sense to have cameras, it seems to me that those same reasons would apply during overtime hours. Um, it looks like there were 15 officers on paid administrative leave in FY19 and then again in FY20. So just curious if those are different people or if it's the same officers and if we've got any really long-term administrative leave, go leave going on. Um, and then we'd just love to understand how the police department's thinking about its summer program. So, you know, the BP led teen police, and the junior police academies, um, and then the ways in which, uh, and then just, you know, speaking from the BPD perspective, sorry not my own time. That was Councillor Mejia's. Um, uh, asking, you know, from the BPD perspective, um, how to think about policing the summer and how to think about, you know, I think we're all worried about youth jobs and opportunities um, and things for our young people to do this summer. Um, and just, you know, I uh, really concerned about what the, um, with so many things canceled, how the police department can approach that, you know, effectively and with compassion and just, you know, thinking, would love to hear the leadership think through that process. Um, so uh, those are police, fewer questions, I think on fire, just I know there were, the recruit class was delayed until March because of challenges with vetting the candidates. So just would love to know where that process currently stands and echo others in asking about the fire cadet program possibility. Um, 
And then on the EMS side, I know that there were some discussion in the response to our request for information um, of sort of hiring challenges and the fact that because all of our new hires have to already be state certified EMTs that narrows the pool and then there's a bunch of tests. And so I think last year we had 111 EMTs applying and then we ended up with 16 new hires. Um, and so just wondering if we could talk through um, the extent to which uh, the city is thinking about solutions to that to that hiring problem and whether, whether we should be talking about EMT cadet programs or not. Um, but, and then I think uh, I, this is back on police, but just definitely want to echo Councillor Asabi George's interest in the best clinicians and adding those to the team. I just think they're super valuable. Um, and then really just, um, I think it would be good to have uh, EMS talk a bit experientially about how this COVID crisis has shifted things for that force in particular, um, which is just so much on the front lines um, and has to deal with, you know, the possibility that any call is a COVID call. Um, and I know that they've implemented a lot of new protocols. And so we'd just like to understand those and also understand that from a cost perspective and just as we look at, you know, the year ahead, if there are things um, for the effectiveness of the department, for the health and well-being of its um, members that we should be thinking about as we kind of continue with a, with a long um, slog through this ongoing crisis. Would just love to hear EMS reflect a bit about that. So I think those are my public safety questions for now. Um, and, oh, I have one more. Well, I'll ask it in the next round. So, um, all right, now we're going to go back up to the top. I don't think I see Councillor Flaherty. So, um, we'll be moving now to, um, public health commission questions. Also, if you have another public safety question that occurred to you and you want to add it, that's totally fine. Um, but, uh, we'll be going back up to the top. So we'll go to Councillor Breeden and then it will be Councillor Campbell and then Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Breeden. Thank you. Um, I had one more uh, public safety question with regard to um, when I talked to the police captain in, in, in District 14, he, he said that one of the biggest challenges they have uh, in our district out here is the in high incidence of mental health crises. And I just wanted to know about training and preparation for uh, intervention in that that context of a, a mental health crisis, someone who's having a, a psychotic event or something. Uh, what what training does the police department have to prepare them to intervene in those situations? That was the only on on other public safety question I had. Um, with regard to uh, the Department of Public Health, I'm, I'm curious about um, the, the overall budget in the context of what we are going through right now, it seems obvious that they're going to need a lot more work, a lot more money and, and more personnel going to help because COVID is going to be with us for a, for a long time, in my opinion. So uh, just in terms of budgetary impacts, what do they anticipate they will need and um, both in personnel, but also in, in perhaps uh, technological support as well. Um, and, you know, in the, if we take COVID off, off the table, what other public health uh, issues are still ongoing that they, um, that they are concerned about? One would be, comes to mind would be, uh, you know, the, 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 sub, uh, the, the substance abuse, substance use and recovery uh, pro issues, and also, um, you know, youth um, gun violence in, in the city. Uh, so uh, just where where do those things intersect uh, in terms of budget priorities? Um, will those things fall further down the budget uh, priority list in the, in, 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 uh, the context of COVID? And those are really the main questions they have for right now. Great, excellent. Thank you, Councillor Breeden. Um, now it'll be uh, Councillor Campbell and then Councillor Asabi George. Councillor Campbell. Um, all right, Councillor, I don't see Councillor Campbell, so uh, we'll jump to Councillor Asabi George and then Councillor Campbell, if you're having trouble, we'll take you afterwards. Councillor Asabi George. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This round, I will just do additional public safety questions and then go to public health in the next round. Uh, just one point though, that I'd like to make sort of a point of clarification 
is we're talking about public safety and we're categorizing fire, police, and EMS in this area. But oftentimes EMS is strictly under public health and isn't a third sort of independent leg of public safety. I'm an advocate of that, have been since I took office and, and really think that they should have equal footing uh, to fire and police and their own independent budget as instead of simply a part of the larger uh, public health commission conversation. I also do want to note, um, Councillor Bach, your comment about the EMT cadet type of program. There is a EMS community program that's kind of like a cadet light, light uh, uh, program and it, it does um, it does sort of offer a, a, some insight or initi initial exposure to EMS school with EMS training and hopefully eventually those uh, students participants will become part of the traditional EMS Academy, uh, which I'm a huge proponent of that program and think it's a, a real way for our young people, especially in the city to access uh, our regular traditional EMS um, EMS opportunity. Sorry, sorry, uh, a couple of things going on here in my mind and in my notes. I also wonder across these three divisions with the, the cancellation of parades and festivals uh, in the current fiscal year and in at least the first part of fiscal year 21, will we see any savings and are, have, those, have those savings already been associated with other costs in particular as it relates to COVID and this pandemic? Um, also interested in the, around some of the external funds, the details, both the fire, police and EMS uh, through those events and, and what the, the loss of some of those programs, I think about concerts and larger scale events in our city that we are no longer or currently not having, what impact that may have on our uh, budget. There's also a capital investment um, currently in design for EMS, the EMS Training Academy. So just curious about an update on, on that project. And then, um, uh, around police, I'm curious about the safe and successful uh, SSYI um, investment and wonder about that increase in investment that we're going to see and can we talk about how that investment will be applied, how many youth will this program serve, and I'm hopeful that it will continue to be in play as it's in partnership uh, between BPD and BH and the, the Health Commission. Uh, so curious about that and then uh, in fire, uh, I, I mentioned shops earlier, but failed to ask sort of about the, the role that firehouses play in uh, sharps disposal because most firehouses do have some sort of sharps box that's not um, uh, publicly accessible to our residents, but just curious about those boxes. How are they used? How are they disposed? What's the volume that they see? And have any, any particular trends that we should be aware of uh, through, those, through those disposal boxes. And then I also failed to mention it's a, it's a really wonderful program that FIRE has uh, in, um, in response to a SAMHSA grant uh, around substance use and mental health services where they are uh, really working to respond to uh, a family in crisis, a resident in crisis that's dealing with an overdose. So just curious about the role that the fire department continues to have in that response. And I really wish that the work that's happening, I think about Squad 80 and EMS, I think about the outreach team and BPD, the work of Boston Fire and accessing our residents who are needing, who are hopeful, uh, hopefully trying to access recovery programs, that the three of them can really be coordinated in their outreach and touching our residents. I think a more coordinated approach between those three public safety departments or arms or legs of the stool uh, a more coordinated approach, I think we would see a greater reward on the other end and greater success for our residents looking for looking for recovery. I feel very um, I, I feel very passionate about the idea that the three of them should be working together and working in partnership because we see some uh, great successes again with each of them individually, greater collaboration, greater partnership. I think that the the opportunity for recovery for our residents is, uh, would be great. I think that's it for me on this end. I will hold my public health uh, commission questions for the next round. Great.
Excellent. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Um, next up is Councillor O'Malley, and then it'll be Councillor Flynn. Councillor O'Malley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so obviously for this round, I'll focus on the Health Commission. Um, I think we are all in complete agreement that the most, per most pertinent and perhaps pressing question that we're gonna ask uh, our uh, Boston Public Health Commission and the myriad departments that come under it is just how their mission will change in a post COVID-19 world. Um, specifically at Age Strong, the Disabilities Commission for Housing Vets, um, the Shelter Commission, how, how the focus and the, uh, the portfolio of work that these departments have under them is going to change in sort of the new, the new world, so to speak. So that's sort of a general question that I look forward to, uh, you know, hearing more specifics, not only from Chief Martinez, but from his relevant commissioners as well. Um, looking over the budget for BPHC, it's pretty straightforward. It is a $9 million increase that can um, almost exclusively be traced to EMS, which is going from 62 million to 69 million, uh, which is great to see because those men and women deserve it. Um, but I noticed that in the revenue of, uh, we've actually decreased the revenue from EMS. So just so folks know, EMS typically on a bad year or on, a, on a, I guess it would be a good year because it'd be fewer calls, still generates 30, 40, plus million dollars worth of revenue that goes back to the city. I mean, it pays for itself, essentially. Um, we're, it, we're investing heavily in it. Presumably we're growing the number of paramedics and EMTs, and yet we are um, uh, budgeting $37 million in EMS revenue when last year we did $38.8 million in EMS revenue. Now, perhaps this is people far smarter than me that just say we should do it this way and then come in over the fact, but I'm just curious where that little disconnect is, why we're budgeting less when we're adding so much money and spilling the ranks, so to speak. Um, so that's a question. It's an EMS question, but it's also, I think, would be better served not by Chief Hooley, but by Chief Martinez. Um, secondly, you know, things seem to be level funded and that's, you know, I think prudent, but again, we're going to be seeing, and we've already seen such incredible, um, just, just uh, a demand on all of our public health uh, aspects uh, in what that is going to look like. I would actually argue that a resubmitted budget should have a, a larger cushion for these uh, incredible services. Again, those serving our vulnerable populations, our vets, our shelter commission, our age strong, our elderly uh, Bostonians. So I, I'd like a little clarity on that, seeing how things have changed from the development of this budget, which is essentially level funded towards what we know we're gonna have to uh, deal with going forward. So that's all, thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor O'Malley. Councillor Flynn. Thank you, Councillor Block. And with this, with COVID-19, I, I would like to see what the training aspect will be for um, our EMS um, team and what they plan to do going short-term and long-term as it relates to training and education specifically dealing with um, these types of issues going forward. We can't rely on the federal, federal government to study these diseases in our responses, our responses. Um, we learn about how to deal with these pandemics from the first line responders. So it's critical that we study, um, we study what, what is happening and working closely with our hospitals, universities, in colleges um, on these types of issues. I spoke earlier about the EMS critical that we have a location in, in the South Boston waterfront. Um, the, residents, the residents need and deserve one. And it's, a, it's not only a public health issue, it's a public, public safety issue as well. I've been working with the, um, the, the health commission on the studies they do on public health in the neighborhoods. Um, I, would, I would like to make sure that our EMS team um, works closely with us on ways that we can help address some of those uh, public health uh, problems that we have across, across our city. Um, and, and during the responses from EMS to to residents, you know, what type of what type of training do they have, knowing about the the ongoing public health issues in a particular 
in a particular neighborhood as well. Um, health and wellness of the um, of all the public health uh, departments is is critical. Uh, making sure that they have the training, the education, and the and the time off during after this pandemic is over, making sure that they have the necessary time off so that they can um, come back to work again in their in their in, in work, continue to work um, in their in their capacity. But I think I think making sure that our first responders have the necessary time off because it's going to be very difficult after this pandemic. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of undiagnosed issues from our first responders and we need to work as a city closely with with the EMS, Boston Police and Boston Fire to make sure that they get the medical care that they need as a result of testing positive for COVID-19. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of long-term um, health related issues for our first responders because of this. Um, thank you, um, Councilor Bach, and um, that's all I have. Okay, great. Um, all right, next up is, uh, oh, I see you've reappeared, Councilor Campbell. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, why don't we, I'm just gonna go to Councilor Mejia because I said she was next. Yeah, no problem, that's fine, thank you. I'll come to you at the end of this round. So, Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I was lounging, thinking that you were going to go with someone else. So um, let me pull up my notes, because this was, I feel like I've been called out of class. Um, it's OK. I can, I mean, if Councilor Campbell's ready, I can go to her. We can come can back. You go to her, because now I have to go look through my notes. And it's yeah, C Councilor Campbell, are you ready? Thank yeah, you. yeah, so I'll be quick. Um, first of all, thank you. Um, I should have just wrote in the chat. I ran to the restroom. I'll be back. Um, so my questions are more on the, the reopening conversation, the testing, which I think other people have also said, so I don't want to duplicate. Um, and, and so and then other stuff I can just email, so I'm all set. But it was just really on the testing and the reopening conversation. Thank okay. you, Councilor Bach. Thank you, Councilor Great. Mejia. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks so much. Councilor Mejia, that wasn't a very long. <laughs> okay, I got this. You, let me just um because i'm reading my notes and i have to superimpose this so i can read them because you know my little old eyes are failing me so let me just get the the font a little bit bigger okay and um you can hear me and see me oh great i've already been on camera <laughs> okay um my second round of questions okay so let me zoom it to 150. This is not being recorded live, is it? So, well, it, it is, but don't worry about it. <laughs> um. Okay, here we go. Second round. This is from Boston Fire um, Department. Following up on Councillor um, Janie's question on the status of female firefighters, one of the reports of um, recommendations was that um, that the BFD holds regular meetings with female firefighters to figure out how to bring about changes. In the, in, in the office culture. And I'm curious to know the status of this recommendation. Um, how many meetings were had? How many female firefighters participated? What were some of the things that they learned as a result of those meetings? And is there a place for us to see some sort of dashboard or a memo? Um, and based on what was learned, what was done about it? I'd like to know. Um, following up on the previous question, um, one of the rec um, accomplishments of the BFD um, listed was evaluating each firehouse to make sure they met the needs of female firefighters. I'm hoping that they can expand on what that process looked like and how they measured success. I'm really curious about those benchmarks. Um, and what is the breakdown of languages spoken by firefighters um, in the Boston uh, Police Department, I'm just curious in terms of um, languages spoken across the city and um, when a firefighter responds to the scene, um, let's just say in a high Haitian Creole neighborhood, um, do they feel well equipped to be able to 
you know, get people, I mean, I know probably to just tell people to leave, you don't need to speak in different languages, but I'm just curious about that capacity um, and that, that type of linguistic um, support, if they have it um, or if they need it. And if they need it, what can we do to help support them with that? Um, and then I'm also curious about um, recruitment and retention goals. I, I know that um, we don't have a lot of people of color or women in the Boston Fire Department. So I'm just curious about what the recruitment strategies have looked like, what, have, what has worked, what can they do differently, what can they uh, lean on on the council to help support with. Um, and I'm just really curious about that budget uh, in regards to recruitment and retention. So one thing again is to get us in, the other, the other part of us is keeping us um, within that department. So I'm just curious about what retention looks like efforts as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Councilor Mejia. Um, I'll just ask a few questions for the Health Commission. Um, so I noticed there's some, you know, BPHC salary savings due to regular employee attrition um, and then forecasting a deficit because of increased overtime expenses. So, I mean, I know obviously we've had to, you know, go to war with this virus with the army that we had. And, uh, and also I know the Health Commission is trying to hire more folks, but just would love to understand the hiring plan for more FTE to address this discrepancy. Um, and I think there's also some detail about the sort of number of folks on administrative and unpaid leave increasing sharply from 64 to 125, which is a fairly high proportion of 1100 full-time equivalents. So I just would love if you could provide some detail for this number. Um, would also love to just, um, to Councillor O'Malley's point about, I mean, obviously I think the real question there's sort of two big category questions about the Public Health Commission, right? One is what resources does the Health Commission need for this year ahead? Um, and how do those need to be adjusted um, from what we've ever needed before in order to sort of fight this fire, as it were? Um, and then the second question is sort of what have we learned from this about how we might want to structure the Public Health Commission differently going forward? Um, so for instance, I, you know, I wonder if, um, I'm not sure if we have a Bureau of Infectious Disease Director right now. And I sort of, um, and obviously, you know, it's it's to some extent just unlucky when you have what vacancies, but um, but I wonder if we might, um, you know, want to think about more permanent inf infectious disease infrastructure going forward. Um, I'm curious what we've learned about operating in relation to FEMA and MEMA and whether there are things, you know, in terms of the coordination where we've where we've realized we might want to structure ourselves differently. I realize some of that is the office of emergency management. Um, and I know that in this budget, there's an addition of a sort of volunteer coordinator position there, um, which I'd love to hear a little bit about, although I'm not sure it's uh, Chief Martinez's thing. Um, and then um, curious, uh, definitely, I think thinking through testing um, and you know, I think we all hope that there's going to be substantial federal money to back our robust testing program, but thinking about what do we have to have in terms of um, staff capacity to roll that out. And then this is kind of on the line between EMS and the Health Commission, but I know that the state has been doing mobile testing using the Fallon um, like ambulance service. And I'm curious whether we've been thinking about mobile testing through Boston EMS, whether that's something that our AMS force would be comfortable with what that could look like to do it like well and safely. Um, so just would love some discussion, discussion of that. Um, yeah. So I think those are my, those are my um, public health commission questions. I have a, one more round for public safety, but first I'm going to go to others. Um, so uh, go back to the top counselor Breeden. Do you have any third round questions? Um. I don't have any further questions at this moment. Thank you. Great. Um, Councillor Sabi George, I know you do. So you have <laughs> thank you, Councillor Bach. I'll take that as a compliment. No, um, you, you, shared it, you said at the end of the second round. I did, I did, I did. But I maybe I'm sensitive to a few of my other colleagues who have commented on the length of my questions. 
I take this process very seriously. And as such, myself and my team prepare very seriously for it. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I do uh, just want to extend some of your comments there at the end. Uh, Boston EMS, I believe through the Department of Public Health at the state level, does have the uh, ability or at least the authorization uh, to do some of that testing. It's come up in our morning calls uh, with Chief Martinez, and I think it would be an excellent question to ask and understand what the implications of our Boston EMS, especially as what I'm hopeful is that we're on sort of, we're certainly at a flatter part of the curve, and that as, as cases become, uh, begin hopefully to decrease, again, fingers crossed, uh, and the cases are much more manageable in number, that we could perhaps do that to keep anyone who is presumptively COVID positive out of the emergency room if it's not necessary uh, to have them there and do that testing offsite. And who better to do that than uh, Boston EMS? I, I think that as a division, they are uh, somewhat and sometimes underutilized. Uh, and we know that they're highly trained and especially in comparison, uh, and no offense to any of the privates, uh, but we know that our Boston EMS is very highly tra trained uh, and can, do, can certainly do this work. And I think along that lines, and I sort of referenced it in my earlier questioning uh, around the third leg of this public safety um, stool, if we were talking about fire, police, EMS should be an equal partner in that. And I do, and, and this has come up over the last number of years through, through the budget cycle, uh, wonder why they are a part of the health commission. And I'm sure that there's some history and some um, some real reason for, for that to be the case. And just sort of perhaps uh, the health commission can go through a little bit, a little bit of that history in their presentation uh, to us. And, um, you know, I, I noticed and, and something else that's really important to my work is our work around homelessness and the homelessness bureau in particular, similar to the EMS bureau. There isn't a real breakdown in the budget under those line items, it's simply that. So understanding that breakdown, I think, would be helpful in, in understanding the role that uh, Chief Hooley has as the chief at the table uh, with the Health Commission, um, as opposed to um, uh, the new commissioner for fire or Commissioner Gross for police, sort of how those relationships evolve and how they work, uh, both in, in practice and everyday operation, but through this budget process, which we're talking about today. Anyway, okay, back. So back to the questions. Um, or I guess there were some questions in that that I, I trust that central staff will be able to weave through, if not happy to help them uh, do that. A around this pandemic, and granted a great deal of our city's resources and assets are really focused on its response, our response to the pandemic. I am curious um, as to the role that the Health Commission will play going forward in um, not just in, in anyone's uh, effort coming out of this pandemic, but in preparedness for the future, should there be something else. We often reference that there wasn't really a binder on the bookshelf in order to respond to a pandemic of this magnitude. I'm, I'm hopeful that the policy and procedures have been, are being written as this effort goes on and I'm confident that they are, but how will this, how will the health commission play a role in preparedness for the future and going forward? Uh, and also, want to recognize the role that the Office of Emergency Management plays uh, in, in that coordination of services and response in preparedness for the future. Um, and then our health centers. I'm, I'm a board member at the Dorchester House Health Center at the House Health, and hope that the health centers are also playing an active role. As I know that they are in testing, uh, I hope that they'll be playing uh, an active role in sort of the, the prepare, preparing for the future response should anything like this happen again. Around homelessness, mental health and recovery, something that's really important to me. I, would, I think it's important for the Health Commission to have a seat at the table. When we talk about family homelessness in particular, I've uh, been advocating for a number of years now at mul in, in multiple departments and at multiple levels for the city to invest in a comprehensive plan um, to, to write a comprehensive plan and to study family homelessness and, and really put to pull together a plan to end family homelessness. The commission plays a really critical role in individuals experiencing homelessness in our city. Uh, so I, I think that they should be a part of the work to end family homelessness in our city. I also want to make sure that there's uh, funding included in the budget to study the implementation of um, current respite shelter beds um, for those experiencing homelessness, both individuals and families. 
the impact it has on uh, those experiencing substance use disorders and sort of understanding that full picture. We know that we're living through it right now, but understanding the future planning when it comes to it. I continue to advocate for an increase in the mobile sharps team. We've been able to do that over the last few budget cycles. We need to continue to do it. We know that there are certain hot spots in our city where there are larger numbers of improperly discarded needles and the mobile sharps team plays a really critical role obviously in picking up those sharps, but the enhanced response that that mobile sharps team uh, pre presents in outreach and really connecting with individuals who need additional supports, uh, they, they really do um, heroic work and are, are true warriors. And I would hope that we're increasing our investment to support them, uh, both increase their capacity but also to really support their efforts because they're doing more than just picking up needles. Um, but I do wanna know how many needles they've picked up, how many individuals they've been able to connect with um, and, and sort of what their greater needs are. We've talked a lot on this council, especially in the last few weeks, uh, but again, it's been something really important to me over the last four and a half, five years around accessing mental health services. I think that there should be a mental health, uh, a, a independent mental health commission certainly that the Boston Public Health Commission would play an informative role in, uh, but I think that we need to make sure that all aspects of our city, all aspects of our society, all aspects of our uh, residents um, should, should be able to access mental health services across the board. And I think one way to ensure that that happens is through the formation of a mental health commission. Uh, we'll continue to have those uh, conversations as well. Um, and then, I talked already about the squad 80 team. I think, you know, again, there's an overlap with the health commission. Um, so I'll just reiterate that. Um, it, although it is clearly significant to me as a parent, um, and we think about the, the impact in our communities and our neighborhoods, it has sort of fallen off the radar a, a little bit with the coronavirus, but the risks around tobacco use, e-cigarettes and vaping um, so it's sort of fallen off the front page, and, and that's because we're in the midst of a pandemic. But I just want to double down on our efforts, especially through the Health Commission, around um, uh, preventing tobacco use, e-cigarettes, and, and vaping. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, the, the capital investment in the Long Island Bridge and in the uh, recovery campus that we're planning and hoping for on Long Island. The Health Commission plays a leadership role in that, if not the, the role in making sure all of that happens, um, certainly in partnership with Health and Human Services for the city. So curious about the Long Island, uh, the facility preservation effort, the development of um, a campus and the redevelopment and, and building of new programs and facilities out there. And then just understanding the status of the current, uh, current study and the current program development. Um, and I think that's it for me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Councillor Sabi George. Uh, Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Chairman Bach. Um, so my questions from the third and last round, I believe it's for um, EMS. Uh, and the Boston Public Health Commission. So um, when we were running for office, uh, two people outside of our campaign office um, had an overdose. Uh, fortunately, EMS was able to get there in time to help them out. I'm just curious to know about the average response time for overdose emergency. How many of those do we get per year? How much um, Narcan um, do they administer every year? Um, so to continue off of uh, Councilor Sabi George's question, it would be great to know if they could speak to how this has changed over time, particularly if they could break it down um, season by season. And I know that Narcan is really expensive. We did not know how, how expensive it was when, um, when we had that situation that happened in front of our office, but it wasn't until we did the training um, that they walked us through how to administer Narcan and um, then we realized how much it costs. So I'm just curious um, about, in terms of training, how often, where do they go? What types of um, partnerships are they creating with other nonprofit organizations to uh, train outreach workers? So it's not just the Boston Public Health Commission that's doing it. You know, what ways um, 
what other ways are we talking about uh, how to utilize the Narcan? I know the Boston Public Health Commission uh, worked in collaboration with our office to produce the training, but I'm just curious about um, just the intersection of these two worlds since they're always there to be the first responders. In regards to the Boston Public Health Commission, um, one of the B PH's uh, C's goals is to make their departments a model for racial equity. And I would love to know what their strategy is to go about that. Um, what opportunities are there to involve the voices of the people in that process and how the city council can help be a part of that process as well. Um, I'm really curious about the level of engagement and, and what that looks like um, in terms of just the rollout, uh, making sure that people who are living the realities are informing the conversations that we're working in collaboration with other nonprofits and it's not just the usual suspects um, who always get tapped to participate. So I'm just really curious about the level of engagement um, as it relates to equity um, and, and that strategy. In regards to the Office of Recovery Services, I would love to know um, more about how many Narcan trainings and they've done as well as um, how much Narcan they've distributed over the past year. That goes back to the question that I asked earlier, but I'm just really curious about that. Um, for all the performance measures listed in the budget narrative, I'm curious to know how they will shift given the impact of COVID-19, specifically around substance use programs and homelessness, um, uh, homeless services. Just wondering what, what that shift looks like and in regards to mental, um, the mental wellness piece of it is just what opportunities exist to have a more um, integrated conversation where we're talking about mental health across all of our city departments. So it's not just living in one place, like that we see mental wellness as part of, of the overall um, well-being of, of every, every, every city employee um, and, any, and every city service, like what opportunities, if any, exist for that type of um, uh, support around mental wellness. And that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Councillor Mejia. Um, I will add a few third round questions of mine, um, which are actually mainly back for public safety. Um, so just would love to understand what overall so far the sort of crime impacts of the COVID-19 situation are. Um, and again, you know, just really worried about summer violence and thinking about strategies for curbing gun violence in the city. Um, I would appreciate um, you know, some account of what the, what the police department is doing proactively, um, just like, you know, over, over the last few years and now to kind of um, partner with the housing authority. I think that one of the things I saw when I was at the housing authority was that they're like, where the housing authority used to have a quite a large police force of its own that had been reduced over the years because of federal funding for that going away. Um, and so there's now just a handful of really great longtime officers on the force at the BHA. Um, and so I just want to make sure that BPD is sort of stepping up to, you know, treat public housing neighborhoods the same as other neighborhoods in terms of needing police, you know, support. Um, and also I know that one of the things that the, how the BHA police, um, had traditionally done was a lot of foot patrols and kind of knowing the folks around and about. And so we'd just love to hear about proactive strategies for um, community and relational policing um, in our uh, public housing communities. Um, Cause I think sometimes, you know, when that isn't in place you get a lot of fear and stereotypes um, that don't, don't work out well for our young people um, who live in public housing. So just would love to address that a bit. Um, and then, um, I know that I know we're going to have a separate hearing about the facial recognition ban, but I think it's um, it's partly come up lately because of a police um, contract that needs to be reprocured related to a digital um, interface that we have with our surveillance cameras. And I just wonder if that's if the department can walk through the timeline on the reprocurement of that and whether it's something that they could just commit to not using the facial recognition update patch. Um, and then um, on the um, and then one other just question, and it's not exclusive to um, our first responders, but it's a question maybe, and it might be better directed at um, Chief Handy um, and kind of HR in general, but definitely have heard um, through the grapevine about issues or that do come up for first responders with workers comp. 
um, and sort of workers comp uh, having reimbursement rates that are too low for to get a lot of service um, in the city. Um, and then you have people with, you know, on the job injuries that they're waiting a long time to get um, addressed and that keeps them on the sidelines and it's not great for our force. So just wanted to raise that issue um, in relation to our first responders um, in particular. So I think those are my, uh, my last round. Um, I count, I'll, I'll just do if, if counselors Breeden, Asabi, George, or Mejia, if I, any of you have any last questions, if you want to just raise your hand or wave at me. Okay, great. Excellent. I think then we are all set. Thank you everybody for joining. And um, I'm just going to gavel this uh, working session of the Ways and Means Committee to a close. We're adjourned. Thank you all. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye. Bye.